recognize the legitimacy of debate. We don't recognize the legitimacy of conflict. And so when we disagree with people, what do we do? We try to say they don't have a right to say what they're saying. It's illegitimate. And once you no longer have a legitimate view, I don't have to listen to you. Hello, welcome to the Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. Uh, before we jump into the show today, I want to put in a plug for The Impact by Sarah Cliff, my friend and my colleague and America's best policy reporter. She has done this phenomenal, phenomenal podcast. You, you heard a taste of it last week on, on this feed about healthcare and about connecting the way policy actually plays out in people's lives. So the reason I want to mention it again is that the, the, the recent episode, Plane Crash Hospitals versus Car Crash Hospitals, is one of the most emotionally powerful pieces of policy journalism I've ever heard. Uh, it is not a happy listen necessarily, although the, the broad trend is very hopeful. What, what she's describing that we can do about medical errors is very hopeful. But she tells a story of a child who died from an infection that is very, very common in America and that in some hospitals has been entirely eliminated or almost entirely eliminated. And it is a really, really tremendous story about organizations and how they work. It's a tremendous story about the importance of things that we often don't talk about. Um, there are a lot of things we could do in our politics for healthcare policy that would matter a lot less than dealing with these kinds of infections. And it'll, it'll just make you look at how the medical system works in, in a different way. Uh, so go check out The Impact. You can subscribe to it wherever podcasts are subscribed to. You're, you're listening to a podcast, so I assume you know how to do it. But it's a really amazing piece of journalism. Like, Please trust me on this. You, If you care about these issues, you want to hear this. All right. Speaking of things that I also hope you want to hear, uh, my guest this week is James Walner, who is a really fascinating guy. He's now a senior fellow of the R Street Institute, um, where he works on their governance project and their legislative branch capacity team. Uh, before that, he was policy director at the Heritage Foundation, which is a big conservative think tank in Washington. He's the author of The Death of Deliberation, Partisanship and Polarization in the United States Senate. He's a political scientist. He worked for a very long time in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he was the director of the Senate Steering Committee when Senator Pat Toomey and Senator Mike Lee ran it. He has served as legislative director to Pat Toomey and before that to Senator Jeff Sessions, who you now know as attorney general. He is a very, very, very thoughtful guy on how Congress works in a very specific way. Um, he really, really gets it. And he has a very unusual way of looking at it. He's almost the only person I know who believes that what we need to make politics work better in this country is to allow a lot more conflict that we are currently suppressing. I know the conventional wisdom is that this is not true. I know the conventional wisdom is that what we need is less conflict, more bipartisanship, more ease, more everybody getting together. And I think that he believes, and he'll say this in, in, in our discussion, that that lies on the other end of the rainbow. But to get there, he thinks that we really need to open up the floodgates. We need to let a lot of debates happen in public and in public processes that are not happening. And it is a really interesting way of thinking about politics. And it is particularly a really interesting way of thinking about Congress, where, where I actually agree with him. I think that the amount of suppression in the process that is happening is making the legislative process a lot worse. So this is a way of thinking about what's wrong with politics that you often don't hear and I think is very worth considering. Um, he also drops some very good advice on relationships and marriages along the way, which I, I wasn't expecting. Uh, we talk about the ways in which the Republican Party is fracturing. We talk about how uh, being a Senate leader has changed since the time of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, this is a, a very, very good discussion for politics and particularly for, for Congress nerds, but I think it's one that everyone should hear. Um, as always, please email me at the Ezra Klein Show at Vox.com. Again, that's Ezra Klein Show at Vox dot com with your guest ideas, with your feedback. I'm curious what you're liking, what you're not liking, who you want to hear on this show, what you would like to hear me answer. At some point, I'm going to do another Ask Me Anything episode. So if you've got questions for that, again, send them to EzraKleinShow at Vox.com. All that said, here is James Wallner. James Wallner, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's I'm excited you're here. Uh, I'm pumped. This is an auspicious time to be talking about Congress. There seems to be a few things going on. So what do you think is a difference in how the Democratic and Republican congressional factions function? So it seems to me that the Democrats deal with conflict internally, 
a lot differently than the Republicans. So it seems to me, at least under the tenure of Harry Reid, that the Democrats, when they would have their lunches, and you could read about this in the paper as well, they would fight. They would yell at each other sometimes. They would have different views. And Reid would let it kind of come out, right? And then out of that, they would somehow figure out, okay, this is what at least our initial kind of posture is going to be. It seems to me that the Republicans don't do that. The Republicans handle themselves behind closed doors like the way I tried to handle conflict in my marriage. And I'm happily married to a, a beautiful woman who I can't believe I convinced her to marry me. But when I first got married, like I imagine most men have, they, you, don't, you don't engage a fight when you see it coming, right? What do you do? You, you try to get that conflict away as quickly as possible. You're like, how do I stop this fight, right? Well, sometimes you need to fight. That's how you get an awareness of each other. That's how you begin to understand how strongly people feel about things, right? And you have to listen to people when they're fighting with you. And you need to affirm and acknowledge their feelings. And you need to react to them and vice versa. Well, when I first got married, I didn't want to do that. That's a bad thing. Who wants to do that? Right? Well, if you never learn how to do that, then it's going to be very hard to have a stable and healthy and productive relationship. It is. And it's not just a marriage. It's a friendship. It's anything. That's what Republicans do when they're behind closed doors. They don't fight. They pretend like they all agree on everything. If things get really bad, there may be a little bit of grumbling, but that's it. Because the idea is that everybody agrees. Well, if you never deal with your problems, what do you think happens? A breakup. And that's literally what you're seeing right now. The party is having a hard time dealing with its problems that it's encountering out on the campaign trail, around the country, in various states and districts, and also in the Congress. And it's magnifying and exacerbating the problem. And to go back to your, you know, the question you opened with, I think the McConnell's style is not conducive to this environment. And the problem is that people don't change. It's a very hard thing for people to change. This is why marriage is so hard, because you come together as adults and you've internalized the way you should operate throughout your life. And then all of a sudden you realize that may not be the best way, right? I have to listen to someone else, especially if you're an only child like me. It's hard to change and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of self-critical analysis and reflection, which is not fun to do. And leaders don't like to change either. I've only seen one leader change dramatically the way that he ran the Senate in his approach to leadership. And that was Harry Reid. How did he change? It seems to me that when Reid first came to leadership, that he managed the Democratic Party and tried to conduct his role in the Senate in a way that's more the early 2000s. That's kind of premised on this pseudo cohesive party structure, top down, kind of old bulls. You don't have liberals and conservatives that are kind of resurgent that are really messing things up so much. And that shifted 2008, 2010, 2012. And the liberal faction, the liberal wing of the party in the Senate became stronger. And Reid shifted with it. And he changed so that he would, he would champion the liberal cause as the kind of initial offer, right? So when he would come out, he would come out leading from, and by come out, I mean come out of his, um, the party caucuses where all these decisions get made today. He would come out leading from the liberal side. And he would fight really hard to show the liberals that he was leading from their side. And then he would pivot and he would compromise. And he would take half a loaf or three quarters of a loaf, or if you're a Republican in the Senate, the whole loaf, right? But he would compromise in the end. And then the moderates and the others who didn't agree with the liberals would be happy. But liberals would give him the credit. They would give him the benefit of the doubt because he tried. McConnell's leadership structure and his approach to leadership it's, it's premised on control. And so he, when you lead from your extreme, from the outliers of the conference, you relinquish that control because it's a little bit more freewheeling. But what he does is he tries to convince everybody why the party should settle. So when he comes out of his party lunch, he's at war with the conservatives trying to tell them why whatever it is that he thinks we ought to do or the bulk of the party thinks we ought to do, while well, that's the best that we can get and therefore we should get it. And so all of a sudden you can see the disparity between the two sides where the Democrats are coming into the fight united. 
and energetic and enthusiastic. And the Republicans are coming into the fight with the leadership, fighting with the conservatives and vice versa, and they're divided. And they're saying, why do we have to do it this way? And so it's no wonder that there's a lot of dysfunction there. And I think that's because McConnell didn't recognize that the environment had shifted in the way that Reed had. I mean, do you think Reed today would be calling out overtly liberal activists and insurgent candidates and saying, you're a white supremacist, you're anti-Semitic, right? Doing, going out of his way to overtly be seen as someone who is putting his hand on the scale to tip the balance away from the liberals? No. It doesn't seem like that's something he would do, but those are the things that McConnell is engaging in. That's what Lyndon Johnson would do. I mean, not as overtly. It was a different time. This is a simplification. But that's the way that he tried to control things. So I do want to note that I don't believe there's another podcast out there that combines this level of congressional procedure wonkery with this level of solid marital advice. <laughs> so, so I do appreciate that. So, so we're talking, it's interesting you bring this up as a signal difference between the parties. So we're talking a day after there was a Senate caucus lunch for Republicans that Donald Trump was at. This was on a day when Trump and Corker had reignited their feud. Corker had said, you know, oh, it's, you know, adult daycare center has failed again. And Trump said, oh, little Bob Corker would have lost in Tennessee without me. A um, couple days after Jeff Flake resigned with a pretty searing speech on Republicans. And I, I was so struck by how everybody handled that lunch. So Tom Tillis, who's a Republican senator, took a picture of himself getting popcorn before the lunch and then, you know, bringing it in and the sort of like joke was, ha, 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 like I'm bringing popcorn to watch the fireworks between, I guess, Trump and, and Corker and, and Flake. And then Trump left the lunch that those guys were at and said, this was a great lunch, um, except for Corker and Flake, I got a bunch of standing ovations. And it, it struck me that clearly nobody talked about anything. Like, clearly nobody worked anything out at that lunch. Like, they they listened to Trump politely, everybody clapped, they did not work out what is a pretty severe set of increasing mistrust between Trump and Republican senators. And that that might seem good at the time, but is not going to help them figure out what's going on with their agenda or give Trump the information that maybe he needs to correct his own course. No, you're precisely right. I mean, again, I wasn't in the lunch, but the lunches that I have been in, there is an inverse relationship between the level of controversy and the number of times that something's mentioned in these lunches. And if something does crop up, then the leadership will typically say, well, we should probably deal with that. Let's have a special meeting or so-and-so is working on it. We're going to figure this out. I just named a working group, right? It's all to disperse the conflict. You don't want to focus the conflict. And that's the fundamental problem. There are deep, major fissures in the Republican Party today. And the elected officials in this town thus far have proven unwilling and uninterested in acknowledging that and trying to do the difficult work of resolving it. This doesn't mean everybody hates each other. It doesn't mean you can't figure it out, but you don't even acknowledge it. That creates a problem. I often get the question when I give talks at colleges and stuff of why shouldn't America have a multi-party system? And I always tell people it does, that the two parties have a bunch of parties within them. I'd like to hear you outline not the fissures in the Republican Party, not just the issues they disagree with, but what parties do you think exist in the Republican Party right now? What, what, what are the factions, and, and how would you describe what they believe? Ooh. Should I just say they have the good guys in the establishment? Isn't that the, the, all, the, all the craze today? No, I mean, you have... I don't pay attention so much to the, the policy positions right now. And I know that sounds odd. But the reason why is that you don't have a kind of inclusive, deliberative process. And so when you're not confronting members with, with questions of substance, there's no place for these policy positions to, to distinguish themselves and for members to differentiate themselves. I think it's more of a temperamental question right now because it takes a certain temperament to walk onto the floor like John McCain did and vote no in a very dramatic fashion. It takes a certain temperament to blow up a unanimous consent request or to, to basically be the skunk at the garden party and, and just mess everything up, all of these carefully laid plans. It, it takes a special temperament to stand up and challenge your peers and their entire social environment that has created the power structures that be. And so in that regard, you basically have the establishment 
And they're trying to defend the structure. They're trying to defend the, the way things are done. And they want to delegitimize any challenges to it. Then you have your insurgents or your outliers, and the same is true on the other side, on the Democratic side, and they want to disrupt that. But let me ask you about three people here, because I, I think this will help me understand your typology. So John McCain, who, as you say, has his temperament where he will be a, a somewhat lonely voice against something. Rand Paul, who has, I think, a pretty different ideology than John McCain, but also is willing to be the skunk at the Garden Party. And, and, and say Mike Lee, who you worked for, who I think is less confrontational with leadership than Rand Paul, but is still somebody, it seems to me, willing to go his own way, willing to be a thorn in the side to, to leadership. Are they, in this typology, the same party because they're all willing to be pretty confrontational? Or is John McCain allied with Lamar Alexander and Paul and Lee and Cruz or something else? No, I think it depends on the issue. I think you saw this with Paul and Lee on the USA Freedom Act, the reauthorization of the Patriot Act, where they were working with Wyden and, and Leahy mm -hmm. and working against uh, McConnell and Reid at the time. You know, it was a very strange, strange thing. I and mean, you get strange bedfellows in the Senate when you do have an open and deliberative process. But yes, there are certain members who will be skunks at the Garden Party, but they're only going to do so on issues that they care deeply about. And the problem becomes they don't all agree deeply in, about this or share the same deep feelings on the on the same issue at the same time. And so as long as you have a one-off, as long as it's just one knucklehead somewhere or one cranky old bull who is just upset about something, you're not going to have many instances like the healthcare vote where they are able to tank everything. I think the problem becomes for the leadership and for the establishment and the people in positions of power who benefit from the existing structure that when they start to sustain a level of frustration across issues because maybe our inactivity and gridlock have become an electoral liability. That becomes an issue. And then I think the bigger threat are the members who aren't necessarily seen as overtly ideological or philosophically driven. Think of your, um, your Senator Perdue's from Georgia, right? More of your kind of business-oriented members, they're just frustrated by the the Congress and the Senate's inability to do things. Ron I think Johnson. Ron Johnson's another a great example. I think that poses a more interesting and challenging um, uh, threat to to the the powers that be because it's not about the bill on the floor at that particular moment. It's more about a sustained critique over time about the way that this process is working and how it's leading them to have to confront suboptimal policy outcomes time and time again. There are a ton of online mattress retailers popping up these days, all with a one-size-fits-all solution to a better sleep. But you know what? One-size-fits-all, it doesn't fit all. Helix Sleep offers something that does not exist anywhere else, a mattress personalized to your unique preferences and sleeping style that will not set you back thousands of dollars. Go to helixsleep.com slash EZRA. You take their simple two to three minute sleep quiz, and then they build a custom mattress that will be the best thing you have ever slept on. And for couples, they even personalize each side of the mattress. If this sounds like, uh, you know, just another product, just think you spend a third of your life asleep. And Helix Sleep customers, they say sleeping on a mattress like this makes your sleep 30% better. Make a third of your life 30% better. Come on, that's a big deal. That's why everyone from GQ to Cosmopolitan to the New York Times are all talking about Helix. Uh, there is very little risk here. Your custom mattress arrives directly to your door in a week. Shipping is completely free and you get to try it for 100 nights. If you don't love it for any reason within 100 nights, they'll pick it up and refund you in full. So really, what have you got to lose? So you go to helixsleep.com slash EZRA right now and you will get $50 towards your custom mattress. Again, that is helixsleep.com slash EZRA for $50 off your order. helixsleep.com slash EZRA. Well, one thing that seems to me to be true within the Republican Party base right now is that there is a very, very, very deep anti-establishment sentiment. And I don't mean establishment the way it's normally meant. I almost mean an anti-leadership sentiment, no matter who the leadership is. So on the one hand, you have Donald Trump, who is a real thumb in the eye to everybody else in the, in the Republican Party. But then in Alabama, you have Roy Moore. There seems to be an almost continuous raising of the bar of what it means to reject the way things are going. And, and that's a place where what you're saying appeals to, to what I feel like I'm seeing now, that there is 
a desire so deeply to see people say, fuck you to the swamp that it almost exists irrespective of ideology. I mean, Roy Moore and Donald Trump are extremely, extremely different, but they feel to me to be drawing on a, on a somewhat similar base of support. And something about Trump backing Luther Strange was inauthentic to his own coalition. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think driving the frustration and cynicism and ultimately anger that you're starting to see on both the left and the right and the electorate around the country right now is this sense that the government isn't responsive to them. And by responsive, I don't mean that it doesn't do what they want. I think we take the wrong lesson from this when we think, oh, well, that has to agree with them all the time and they have to win all the time. Um, that's not what I mean. I mean responsive in terms of, go back to the, the marriage analogy. When you're in an argument with someone, you have to affirm their position. You need to acknowledge that you hear them. You need to acknowledge that what they feel is real. And you need to acknowledge that that's an issue. And even if you had nothing to do with it, the last thing you need to do in that situation is say, this is why you're wrong. And this is why I'm right. And so therefore you should be not angry and you have no reason to be angry. So now can we go to dinner? Right? That, that's not going to go over very well, right? That's exactly what the Republican leadership is doing right now. And it seems to me more effort and energy needs to be focused on what are the voters, the activists, the independents, all of what, what is their concern and why do they feel like things aren't working? But let me ask you something because there's, there are two really interesting directions to take this and I'm going to take them in both in order. But first I want to talk to you about the suppression of ideas. Because what you're saying there is that something that that both sides in politics and the Republican Party at this moment is trying to do, and I think this is right, has been to suppress certain debates. And Trump, to me, more than anything else that, that powers his rise, is he recognizes that there is a debate about immigration in particular and just demographic change and changes in cultural status that is being suppressed, that Democrats are on the other side of, and Republicans have decided because they want to win the Latino vote going forward, they don't want to have, right? They're going to back the Gang of Eight, or if not, they're not going to vote for it, but they're not going to go sort of full Trumpian, you know, let's build a wall. And so there's this explosion of a candidate who cannot be controlled by the party and gains his power from channeling the energy in a suppressed ideology. But isn't that what we've always done in politics? I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad necessarily, but hasn't one function of politics always been to say there are some things that the elites of the two parties have tried to move off of the table, even if there are a lot of, you know, say post-1965 segregationists running around that you don't have that debate over and over and over again? It, it, it feels to me that on the one hand, you could take this and say the lesson is never suppress debate. And on the other hand, you could take this and say, Actually, the, they've simply failed to have the tools to do it any longer. Does that make sense? No, it makes complete sense. I think, I think we need to change how we think about conflict. I mean, to go back to this theme of mine. The process of politics is absolutely vital, and we've lost sight of that. And it's vital in terms of resolving conflict. We have this way of looking at conflict as something that is bad and we have to get rid of it. And the only way to do great things is to wall off the process from all of this conflict. Well, sometimes you need the process to reconcile people to what you ultimately do. And the civil rights debate is a great debate. This country was deeply divided. On one side, you had people fighting for more civil rights. And then on the other side, you had people wrongly saying, no, we want to keep segregation. But... The approach wasn't to say, okay, we're going to do this thing and we're going to craft it behind closed doors and we're going to come out and we're going to jam it down your throats. That wouldn't have worked. What did they do? They had an open debate. They voted down all kinds of stuff that they thought was horrific and awful and bigoted and racist. They, that's what they did. And the debate itself served to bring the Congress along and the Senate along and by extension, the country along the Voting Rights Act, and so on, so that we don't continually relitigate these issues because they were already litigated. Uh, another great example of this is the late 19th century with the imperialism debate, 
right? After the Spanish-American War, what are we going to do with all of these things that we now, I guess, own? I guess that was the debate at the time. And a lot of people, it was a very interesting partnership. You had like Andrew Carnegie and William Jennings Bryan on the same side of an issue. And it's like, what's going on here? But they, and then you had Teddy Roosevelt and others, and they were saying, we want these colonies. And others would say, no, we're not an imperial people. But they had a debate and it brought the country along and the, the divisions were lingering, but we don't argue over Guam, right? That's not an issue anymore because that was a big debate. Although there is a, actually, I do think one interesting thing about this is there's currently clearly a debate that we're not having in the way we need to about what status does Puerto Rico have in this country. Right. Now, these are, and this is my thing, and the left and the right do this, the middle does this. This is the big problem in our politics. We don't recognize the legitimacy of debate. We don't recognize the legitimacy of conflict. And so when we disagree with people, what do we do? We try to say they don't have a right to say what they're saying. It's illegitimate, right? So if you disagree with, say, Jeff Sessions on voter ID, right? Your, your position on Jeff Sessions' position on voter ID is not that it's bad, that it keeps, that it keeps African Americans from voting, or it, 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 it targets poor people, or, or all these other things that, that people on the left could say. No, you say he's a racist. You know why? It's easier. It makes it more difficult for him to come back and say, well, no, I disagree with that. You, know, you can't. It shuts debate down. The same thing over foreign policy. We're not having a debate over foreign policy. These are the things that have been fueling Trump. Why aren't we having a debate over foreign policy? If you criticize the interventionist mindset of both parties right now, what, what do people call you? They call you an isolationist. Well, what does that do? That shuts the process down. You no longer have a legitimate view. And once you no longer have a legitimate view, I don't have to listen to you. You're not right. Why is the leadership of the Senate Republican Party calling Steve Bannon a white supremacist right now? Why are they calling him anti-Semitic? Because if you can delegitimize Steve Bannon, then you make all of the angst in the electorate about the incumbents and their performance in office go away. So there are two things I want to say on this. So one, some of those cases, I think there it goes both ways, right? That there is a desire to say, well, if you say somebody might be a racist, which I'm not going to make an argument one way or another right here about Jeff Sessions, but if you say somebody might be a racist, you're just trying to delegitimize debate when obviously there are racists in the world. Right. <laughs> there are anti-Semites, there yeah. are white supremacists. Um, there's a whole lot of evidence at this point that Steve Bannon did a lot of explicit coordinating with Milo and, and white supremacists while building Breitbart. But the other thing that I do think is interesting there is... I don't have a name for this yet. I've been thinking about it a little bit. It's the res which argument chooses to get responded to. It's interesting the way you said the voter ID debate. Because what I heard you say were three points that I actually always hear made in the voter ID debate. But then rather than respond to any of them, Jeff Sessions says, oh, somebody somewhere called me a racist and God, it hurts. There's also a question of what people want to respond to. Um, Oftentimes, what debate you have is not the only debate one could have, but what the person in power decides to actually engage. And Trump is very much like this. Trump does not want to respond to the you know debate about his policies. He says, you know, he responds to the strongest possible version of criticism of him, sometimes one that, that people aren't making. Which is all to say that it feels to me like there's a lot of conflict, and one tricky thing about just using conflict as a way to get to agreement is that conflict doesn't stay clean. People get heated. Right. I'm not even saying that Jeff Sessions, when he chooses to try to respond to whether or not he's a racist, as opposed to whether or not he is pushing a set of policies based on a problem that doesn't exist, that clearly have the um, outcome of suppressing African Americans from voting. But there's a reason he's responding to one and not the other. Right. And like I said, I think both sides, all sides do this right now. This is endemic in our politics and it's endemic in how we think about things. I'm not, look, I'm not a relativist. I don't think all views are equal. I'm not suggesting that whenever someone says something, we need to give it the full benefit of the doubt. That's nonsense. But that's a far cry from when the initial reaction of pretty much everybody today is to go to the extreme right? Another example, you've politicized something. Right? Yeah. Well, why is that bad? It's politics. That's literally how we deal with difference in a society like ours. Without politics, you have tyranny. 
right? That's how we do it. We bemoan this idea that, well, we no longer have common spaces and we no longer have common newspapers or, or common media outlets. Well, guess what? That's literally what Congress's job is. And so I, we should see more conflict there. And the problem is, I just finished reading a, a great, fabulous little short book by a guy named Alan Jacobs. It's called How to Think. And I came across it, I stumbled across it, and I picked it up, and I'm like, well, I'm going to read it. And you know, a couple hours later, I was done. It's real short. But he, he tackles this problem in our society, not in our politics necessarily, about how do you think and then respond and then ultimately communicate across differences? Because that's the core challenge of our time, in my opinion. And a lot of people out there say, well, the answer is just to make sure everybody agrees. Well, that's not going to happen. And I don't want to live in a place where that does, because again, that's tyrannical, right? I like diversity. I like differences of opinion. I like different forms of artistic expression because that's the stuff that makes life worth living. That's what Western civilization is all about. So how do you deal with it and how do you communicate across these differences? Well, he talks about, take a step back when you're in an argument with someone. And, and, and I forget if he calls it the five-minute rule or something else, but, but really try to put yourself in the other person's shoes before you respond, right? Take a deep breath. Or he talks about the steel man argument, which is yeah. not his, it's someone else's, but instead of a straw man, right? Well, these are hard things for people to do. And they're certainly hard in politics where you have media, where you have uh, an instantaneous kind of response structure. And so the what, what bringing conflict into that process does is it forces you to deal with other people's arguments. And it forces you to try to reflect on your own position, right? If you're trying to push a bill in the Senate and all of a sudden the other guys are literally willing to stay all night for the next seven days and they're going to force you to do the same thing, you're going to say to yourself, do I really care about this, right? And then you're going to reflect on that. And then you're going to compare it to what the other people are doing. And you may say, I do. And then you're both going to stay. And then when you both stay, you're going to kind of come, come into conflict with each other. Right? And you can only reduce, to go back to what we were saying earlier about this uncertainty in the environment, right? where nobody really knows where everybody is anymore. There are no more cues that you can take because everything's in flux. And so the only way to reduce that uncertainty in a place like Congress is to bring members together in conflict with one another. That's when you begin to have awareness. And then when you have awareness, you can say, okay, well, wow, okay, maybe we do all agree. Or Maybe, more often than not, we don't agree, but I really care about this part of the bill, and you really care about that part of the bill, so then maybe why don't we just log roll here and agree on those things? And that's how stuff works. And I think our inability to see conflict is a good thing, to seek it out, to embrace it, and say, this is how we're going to make this country better, and this is how we're going to educate ourselves and the American people, and this is how we're ultimately going to arrive at better outcomes. Until we do that, I don't see this changing at all. In fact, I see more of the same, if not getting worse. Have you ever read the book Stealth Democracy? I have not. All right. So this is a book that has influenced my thinking a lot. And, and you'd be interested in it. And it, But it, it has almost the exact opposite takeaway. So I'm, I'm curious how you think about it. It's a book by two political scientists. And what they, what they do, based on looking at some very, very big national surveys in a lot of different ways, is they show that the American people, they don't actually have very strong views on policy. It's very, very, most people don't know, very, very easy to get people to change their minds. You ask people, are you sure? There's a 20% difference in the poll response. People's views about policy are weak, but their views about what process should look like are strong. And in particular, one thing they believe is that there should be agreement. And that if there's not agreement, if people are fighting and they're arguing, that probably means special interests have taken over the process. That means somebody's not working for you because common sense would just be there otherwise. That otherwise people would just be able to get together. And you hear this in politics, right? Barack Obama in 2008 ran on a version of this. You know, if, if we just didn't have so many special interests and people were just working together, they could find agreement. Like, this is something else happening. It's coming into the process. It's creating all this conflict. George W. Bush was a uniter, not a divider. There is this continuous vision that somewhere just over the horizon with the right leadership is a politics that is non-conflictual. 
And, and, and their evidence suggests that the reason we have this view is that people believe that a politics that is conflictual somehow implies that you're getting screwed. And so if people see all this conflict, they end up mistrusting the result of it. The way this influenced me was it seemed to me to explain something very smart McConnell did with Obama. He created a lot of conflict, made it very, very hard for Obama to get bipartisanship, and recognized that if there was more conflict, irrespective of what was in the bills, people would like them less. I think Democrats have learned that lesson too. So if there is more conflict, how do you rate the chances or how do you prevent people from absorbing that as actually evidence that politics is more broken and they're just getting more screwed? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's entirely different from what I've been saying. Maybe I'm just oh, really? crazy. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not talking. Because that's saying that people are going to watch this and they're going to they're going to hate it. Right. So it's not going to be the norm, right? All the time on every issue, right? Think about it like this: When people think about Congress, they think about you know regular order, how a bill becomes a law, schoolhouse rock, committees, everything else. So my assumption, I've not read the book. I will, is that most people probably think that's happening. They think their representative has a say, right? They think the people that they vote for, even if they don't even know who they are, go to Washington and they participate and they represent their interest. And that's the way the system ought to work, right? That's, that's a good thing, right? These American people have jobs to do. They have other things to attend to. We live in a republic for a reason. It's better than a direct democracy. And so they assume that's happening. And so outcomes are going to reflect that. And if the process works, they will reflect that. Once you know that both sides are going to have a say, you begin to construct a process that facilitates that as opposed to trying to stymie it and stop it, right? And then in that environment, right, when you do have deeply divisive issues that are controversial and the two sides can't agree, well, then guess what happens? You get a big fight. And what does that fight do? That fight keys in people who have other more important and more interesting things to worry about, that something important is at stake. Because sometimes the elected representatives aren't going to solve all our problems. There's not, it's not a given that you're always going to have an outcome, right? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes gridlock will happen. And when that happens, the American people will tune in because they're going to say, whoa, this is interesting, right? I'm not sure I like it. What's going on here? Let me learn about it, right? It may be in a rational way, it may be in a not so rational way, but they're going to pay attention. And then all of a sudden, by bringing them into the process, it could be enough to tip it one way or the other, right? Maybe there's a poll that comes out. Maybe there's a big concerted phone call campaign or a media campaign. And even then, maybe it can't be resolved. Then an election intervenes, right? And the people say, well, I didn't like the way you stood on this representative. I'm going to send somebody else there. And then they come in and then they pass a bill that they couldn't pass before. And then that outcome is more stable moving forward. And that's the way the process really ought to work. And that's not how it works now, because now we try to blur distinctions. Now we try to suggest that we're all in agreement when we're not, that we're stronger than we are, and that there is no real conflict. It's all this phony, fake conflict. And last thing I'll say on that is that the assumption now is that politics is what happens at election time. And that is when you can really change things. And then after an election, everybody comes, the die is already cast, and this is what's going to happen. But that's not the way it works. Politics is ongoing all the time. And you need a process that recognizes that and allows for fluid outcomes and allows for participation by a bunch of different members with different views. Otherwise, why come? right? These guys work hard, right? I, I know I've been beating up on the Senate a lot. I loved the Senate. My last day there, I wept like a baby. It was very embarrassing, right? It was, it was hugely embarrassing. I was just sitting there talking to the office and I just started like just crying uncontrollably. I love the place. It's an extraordinary institution. And this country is so great because of it. And it is, it is so sad what's happening to it right now. But the members too, they're, they're hardworking. They come here. They have families at home. This is not an easy job. And I think we give them a hard time a lot of the time. And, and they need to be allowed the opportunity to do the job that they wanted to come here to do. And yes, part of that is on them for not demanding it. And part of it's on the people who help create the climate that tries to encourage them not to do it. 
With everything going on in the world right now, it is so important to understand the history and the circumstances that brought us here. It's why you might want to check out the Great Courses Plus. Uh, I've been talking about them for years. You can learn there about anything that interests you from the best professors in the world, professors who not only know their subject, but know how to present it. They've got unlimited access to over 8,500 lectures, which is a ton. And you can learn about anything, history, science, business, how to cook, mindfulness meditation, uh, photography, all of it. And now you can watch these video lectures from your TV, your laptop, or mobile device, or you can stream the audio through the Great Courses Plus app. So you can start in the morning on your computer learning about photography and then continue on in your tablet and then later on switch to the app. It is a way to learn everywhere, wherever you want to be, whenever you are there, on a plane, when you're traveling, when you're at work trying to not work. It's great. It's a it's a real way to, 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 to learn at all points in your life. With the Supreme Court back in session, one lesson you might particularly enjoy is the history of the Supreme Court. They have fascinating insight into cases like Roe v. Wade, Brown v. Board of Education, and how the court's decisions often reflect the very complex interaction of personality and politics and culture. It is a great way of thinking about where the court is now and where it is likely to go. Um, I know you're going to enjoy The Great Courses Plus, uh, and even better, they are giving my listeners an entire month to watch and listen to any of their courses for free. But you need to sign up through my special URL. So start your free month today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. That is greatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. I think that among a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, McConnell has a reputation as this master tactician, this tremendous opposition force to Obama. And people are a little confused why the Senate has not been more effective for Republicans under his leadership. What is your view of McConnell's leadership so far? I think right now, if you look at the Senate and look at what McConnell is doing and how he's managing the place, I think you're seeing a lot of things come out. And the one unifying idea that I'd like to leave you with is that the way that the Senate makes decisions is in response to conflict, right? And in conflict in its environment. And right now, that environment has changed, and it's changed considerably. And we can talk about why and the ways how, but the fact remains that it's changed. And I think the failure of the leadership in the Senate right now is their inability to change with it. And it seems to me that McConnell is managing a Senate with a set of tactics and an approach that may have been well-suited for a different time, but it seems to be terribly poorly suited for today. Well, how has it changed? Let's be specific about that. Right. Well, what I like to do, what I like to tell people and and the stories I like to tell about the Senate, I like to go back to LBJ, right? Lyndon Baines Johnson. We remember him today because of Robert Caro's fabulous biography, Master of the Senate. We remember him as the Master of the Senate. What we forget is that he was a leader bounded in time and his power, and he did have a lot of it, and he was extraordinary when it came to being a legislative leader in a lot of ways, depended on a certain institutional structure. Well, what happened at the end of the 50s when he left and went to the White House in 1960 or 61, I should say, as the vice president? It changed. The environment changed. The issue agenda changed. The constellation of advocacy groups on the outside changed. And as a result, the senators themselves changed. 1958, you have a whole bunch of Northern liberal Democrats come in who up in the institutional structure and start to change the way the place works. 1960, 62. And at this time, Mike Mansfield comes into the role of the Senate leader and he starts to manage the place differently. And then we have this golden age, as people say. What's the the difference between them? That's a piece of history I think is interesting, but people don't know. Right. So Johnson, the way that he managed the Senate, it rested on strong, powerful committee chairmen, old bulls, that sort of thing. And he liked to control deliberations and he liked to try to control outcomes. He didn't want a free flowing debate. He worked behind the scenes and saw the floor as a place to kind of rubber stamp what they were able to work out elsewhere. Sound familiar? Well, that becomes harder and harder and harder when the power centers on which you depend get weaker and weaker, right? And so had Johnson stuck around, I submit, it's a counterfactual, we'll never know for sure, but I submit we wouldn't remember him as the master of the Senate. He probably would have been a failure. Already, the rank and file were chafing at his um, heavy-handed, top-down, centralized approach to leadership within the Democratic Party even before he left. And then Mansfield comes on, And he has a different personality, and he's not Johnson, and he knows that. But he also knows that he can't control and run the Senate in the same way. So what does he do? He takes a step back. He lets go. He says, no one can control this place the way that they did before. 
And so I'm going to focus on making it as smooth as possible and facilitating the participation of individual members in the process, working with the minority leader as well, Dirksen. And I'm, if there are problems that arise, I'll work them out on the back end. But I'm not going to try to control outcomes on the front end. Just, and that led to real the quick, golden age. When you say front end and you say back end there, what are the front end and what are the back end? So the back end I would call or refer to you know, it's the Senate floor. It could be in committee as well. But the idea is that you're not controlling the process. And if it reaches an impasse, if if senators blow it up with some crazy amendment or they can't go any further, but it's a really important bill, that's when the leadership would get involved. And that's when they would try to untangle this problem and then move forward. So this is, I think, an interesting way to think about it. But when I when people talk about how the Senate has changed— the thing they tend to focus on now is party polarization. This period you're talking about, there, there's a story I love from it. So 1964, Lyndon Johnson, now president, uh, has now won re-election. He's got a Senate liaison, right? The, the, the guy in the White House who runs Senate strategy for Johnson. And the Senate liaison is writing a memo about Medicare, which is not yet passed. And he says that, you know, looking at all the people who won Senate elections and lost Senate elections, if you have all those people there and voting, then Medicare will pass with 55 votes. And, and there are two things I think are really amazing about that. One is that uh, first, he doesn't say 67, which is how many you needed back then to kill a filibuster. So he's not expecting a filibuster on Medicare. Um, Medicare actually passes, I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact number, but around 70 votes. There's a huge amount of Republican support for a Democratic president's social, you know, single-payer health care system for, for the elderly. The level of, of, we did not have then the level of ideological polarization layered on top of party polarization that we have now. And that seems to me, in a lot of the standard accounts, to have unlocked a lot more coalition making, a lot more strategic options than leaders have currently. So, so how does the really bitter level of polarization we have now influence the account? Right. I, I think it's certainly different to the extent that the parties were more divided than, than they are today. I think that's clear. I think it's not so clear that they're as unified today as we often think they are, right? I don't think that the parties, and this is something I've been you know, harping on for a long time now, they're not as unified as people think they are. And one of the reasons why it appears that they are is because there's no process. There's no kind of organic legislative decision-making. And one of the lessons, I think, over the past 10 months, at least for Senate Republicans, is that they're not as unified as everyone thought they were. And it turns out there may be a lot more agreement between them and Senate Democrats on a lot of issues like healthcare and other things than people think. And so it stands to reason that if you had a more deliberative and open and freewheeling, if not chaotic process, you would probably get a lot more bipartisan outcomes on a lot of very surprising issues. One of the signal features of the Senate that is the absolute most confusing to me, and I had a long conversation uh, on this podcast with Michael Bennett from Colorado about it, he seems upset about it too, and, and I did not quite get an answer that I ever found totally satisfying, is why groups of senators do not drive forward their own bills. It is very opaque to me what kind of power the leadership wields, which leads to the coalition that cares about criminal justice reform never getting that bill to the floor, which leads to Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray now seem like they really don't have a chance of getting a, a vote. What is happening that in a Senate, where if you sit down with literally any member of it who is maybe not Mitch McConnell, though possibly also maybe Mitch McConnell, you, they will tell you that they do not like how it works. This is not how it is supposed to go. They, they feel like they're not doing their job. They're not legislating. Why is it that they are not able to rise up and take some power back and begin putting the things they are interested in and forming ad hoc coalitions and their own processes and their own groups and using their leverage to drive their own priorities into the process. Well, you're absolutely right. The Senate leaders are not House leaders. They actually don't have any power, right? The extent of McConnell's power, at least on the floor of the Senate, is lies in the fact that the chair calls on him first. That can change tomorrow. That could change this afternoon. But that's literally it. And then the deference that his members give him. Anybody can move to proceed to a bill. Anybody can offer amendments. Anybody can do all these other things, but they don't. And I think it's a confluence of, of several factors for why. But I, the, the most, I think, underappreciated is just the social cost. When you come as a new member, 
the entire place is geared to make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about, right? And you may be an expert on, say, education, right? Like Senator Bennett. And you may know a lot about it, but guess what? When you start challenging the way that the place works, you're not talking about education anymore. You're talking about, um, you know, all these institutional norms and ideas. And then all of a sudden people just react very, very negatively. And so it, they want to make you feel like you, you don't know what you're talking about. And to go back to put yourself in a senator's shoes, standing on the floor of the Senate, as I found in my professional career there working for members, and standing up against all of the powers that be, oftentimes on both sides at the same time, and stopping things, you know, being a skunk at a garden party, it's a very lonely place. And there are not many people who say to themselves, that's what I want to do, right? They look for a way to get along. And so it's just a hard thing to overcome. But what I would say to you is the same reason why the leadership isn't able to pass bills today using this kind of secretive process, it's the same reason why the Gang of Eight fails and other things fail. Because the idea is that if we could only get the reasonable, rational people into a room somewhere and we can craft some bill and then we can just put it on the floor and then it'll pass because it's bipartisan. But it doesn't socialize members to the suboptimal outcome. It doesn't bring them along. It doesn't make them feel like they have a say. It's the exact same process, just a different cast of characters. And so ultimately, that's not the solution. The solution to this is for members to just fight for their priorities and their prerogatives in the process. And when they come up against the effort of another and they have to deal with each other as equals and they're starting to vote on things and the American people can tune in and see what's happening, then you start to get a new equilibrium that's established. So this gets to something I've been thinking about the last couple of days a lot and that, that I talked with Senator Bennett about quite a bit. At the core of what you're talking about here is just a form of cowardice. I'm going to be the skunk of the garden party. A lot of these are good people. Um, they, they seem like they have big egos. They've done hard things, right? It takes a certain amount of courage to run for office. You, you have the, pro, the possibility of real humiliation in front of a huge number of people if you lose. And yet they get to the Senate and then everybody kind of meekly submits. And then we've had this thing in the last couple of weeks. Bob Corker decided to retire in order to criticize President Trump, as far as I can tell. Jeff Flake gave a speech about how the rest of his party is abdicating its responsibility to exercise oversight and, and put boundaries on, on an out-of-control president. And the punchline is that I'm going to retire too, so I can speak freely for the next you know, year and a half. And I'm sitting here listening to these guys get praised as brave all over. And this doesn't feel like the definitions of bravery I've heard, that the idea of going against your party or going against the rules or go or making problems for for the other members of your caucus, even when you think it's of profound moral importance, is so socially unpleasant that in order to do it, you leave or you don't do it at all, as in many of the cases here where you're talking about people just don't bring things to the floor or don't defy their leadership and vote to bring a bill to the floor that they would support that their leadership wouldn't. I don't understand because I, I I know a lot of these folks. I report with them. They're, they're, I don't think that they are so cowardly, and they certainly are all very high up on their own egos, and they hear a lot and read a lot about great statesmen of the past, and then they get here and they act like this. Why? I mentioned a confluence of factors earlier, right? The social kind of pressure, the intimidation, the peer pressure, right? Think of it in terms of high school. That's very real, and it's there, but it's not the only thing. I think partisanship still does play. I mean, the parties are divided. But there's still this sense that it's a red team and a blue team. And if you mess things up, right, then you're going to give the other guys an opportunity to come in and really win. And that's going to be really bad. And it's all going to be on you. So think about someone like Senator Murphy, right? Chris Murphy from Connecticut. He's a passionate advocate for uh, various gun control measures, right? And after the latest uh, tragedy, the latest shooting, he says very emphatically, because he feels strongly about it, that Congress needs to get off its ass and it needs to do something, right? What did he do after that? He granted unanimous consent to process a whole bunch of meaningless noms all week, right? He has the ability to force this issue onto the agenda if he wants, my guess is it would be voted down very quickly, but he has that ability. My guess is his own leader wouldn't want him to, to exercise it, right? But 
he doesn't use it. And the reason why I would, I, I'm guessing, I'm not in, inside his head. I don't know him. I haven't sat in these meetings. But my guess is that the party leaders have Im implored him not to, right? And even during the budget in the Senate, you see these articles where, where the minority leader is, is, is telling everybody, we're not going to really adjudicate the gun issue. Right? We're going to keep it on taxes. Well, my guess is there's an internal debate. And they probably decide, well, that's not the best issue for us to defeat this budget or to defeat this tax bill or to draw these bright contrasts between the parties that are necessary for us to come back and win the majority. And that's when we can do all the great stuff, right? That's when we're finally going to arrive. And this is what Republicans have been told for the past eight years, if not longer. And that's, I think, underlying a lot of the frustration right now. But let me ask you about the partisanship side of this. So take John McCain. John McCain is a guy who, at the absolute critical moment in the Obamacare appeal and place debate, walks onto the Senate floor and turns down his thumb like it's Game of Thrones and kills, for that period, the most important legislative priority Republicans had. And then, when it's his best friend's bill, Graham Cassidy, Lindsey Graham, his best friend, a guy he thinks of like a son, he said, he kills that too. He's not kicked out of the Republican Party. And, and now, to be fair, he's not running again for re-election. I mean, he's facing a very, very serious brain cancer diagnosis. So there's a way in which he's freed. But the parties need, particularly in a closely divided Senate, they need their members in many ways more than their members need them. There, there is this implied, incredible um, fealty. And, and you would expect it's because the parties have so much power over primaries and over fundraising. But Roy Moore won his primary just fine. Flake is terrified that he would he was going to lose his primary, which he probably would have done in Arizona, despite the fact that he would have had the support of the Republican establishment. John McCain is opposed to his best friend and jettisoned his party's central idea on process concerns. And he still gets, a, I mean, he, as far as I can tell, he suffered no social sanction at all. So so what is it? I mean, you, you talk about it. Partisanship, it can kind of stand in as a scary sense. But, but what is the sanction people are wielding here? Right. Well, there, there are limits to it. And again, first of all, there are not many members who are willing to do what McCain did. I think people should really appreciate that. At the end of the day, there are only a handful of members, probably count them on one hand, on both sides of the aisle that are willing to come in and, and, and tank something like that. Um, but partisanship is really enforced. The social peer pressure is enforced by yourself. This is the Senate. The leaders don't have any power, right? They it's not fundamentally changed since the Senate of the olden days that people are familiar with. So when you talk about sanctioning members, the only thing that can sanction the members in the Senate is either the full Senate or the conferences, right? You could change your rules and you could kick that member off of a committee, but they're going to be very loath to do that because they also harbor those same feelings about the underlying legislation. McCain's not that much of an outlier. The only difference was a lot of the other members who were equally upset with the process ultimately went along with it begrudgingly because they felt intimidated and pressured and they ultimately complied with it. So I'm a magazine journalist going way back. My first job in journalism was at the American Prospect, which is a policy magazine, and I remember it fondly. Uh, magazine journalism is still what I turn to to read when I when I am traveling or when I just want something to read before bed. Uh, I absolutely love it. But the problem is it, it hasn't quite made the, the jump to the digital age. If you're traveling and you got a bunch of magazines, it's heavy, makes your carry-on heavy. It, the whole thing doesn't work. So that's why it's important that Texture has reinvented magazine reading for the age of smartphones and tablets. Uh, the Texture app, it gives you unlimited access to over 200 premium magazines all at once. So you pay one flat fee and you get all 200 magazines, all their back issues, the whole thing. They have leading titles like Time, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and Wired. And right now you can try Texture for free. That is right, for free. Just imagine having your favorite magazines and their back issues anytime, anywhere. You can search what you want. There's multimedia content. They have recommendations for you based on what you like. You will never be able to read as much as Texture is giving you the ability to read. Uh, to start your free trial, again, for all 200 magazines, you go to texture.com slash EZRA. And if you choose to continue, podcast listeners will get Texture for just $9.99 a month. That is over 30% off of their listed price. Again, that is $9.99 a month for 200 magazines, uh, full access to them and their back issues. They've also got great gift options available for the holiday season for the magazine lover in your life. So go to texture.com slash EZRA to start your free trial today. Again, that is texture.com slash EZRA, texture.com slash EZRA. 
So you and I spoke a lot, and I spoke with many people um, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle in the years when Democrats ran the Senate. And there was a real powerful feeling, broadly shared among Republicans, that this closed process the Democrats were running was a, a real problem. Mitch McConnell in 2014 gives a speech called Restoring the Senate. And it's really his manifesto for if I'm put in charge, what I'm going to do. And he talks about, you know, regular order and open processes. And, you know, the way that Obamacare was passed was this uh, unbelievable travesty. And then Republicans get power and they run a more closed process, certainly on health care, than Democrats ever did. Tell me how to understand what happened there. Were they all lying? And why not run an open process? Some Why not run hearings, at least to start? Why not give it a shot? I, to this day, do not have an understanding of why they decided to do health care and, to some degree, taxes the way they did, and why, when it stopped working, they still never changed. You mentioned McConnell's speech on the floor of the Senate. I was sitting on the floor at the time I listened to it. It was a fabulous speech. It was great. It was, this is the way the Senate's meant to work. And when it works that way, it ends up doing more. After that speech, I left the floor, got on the elevator with a bunch of members, a bunch of senators, and one of them said on the way down, well, I don't know what Mitch was talking about, but I'm not going to be here on a Friday, right? <laughs> and that's the problem. McConnell and his allies have cultivated this sense that he is an emperor that has godlike powers that can somehow create possibilities out of impossibilities. And that's not true. He doesn't have that power. He doesn't have really any power beyond the chair recognizes him first and his members defer to him on most things most of the time, right? I don't know what Mitch is talking about, but I'm not going to be here on a Friday. But he had the power to not run a completely closed process on Obamacare. I mean, that was a choice. Yes. Obamacare, it was an interesting thing. I think, I think he wanted to go with the original 2015 bill first because that was what they could ultimately pass, at least based on what they did in 2015. That's the bill where you repeal and delay, right. basically. Exactly. Yeah. And then you come back in and you start to tackle the things you couldn't get, right? But when the House decided to couple the two together, when the administration— and Couple the Obamacare and tax reform. And repeal— so repeal and replace. Oh, couple repeal and right. replace together at the same time. Right. Yes. And this is the fundamental thing that ultimately, in my opinion, undermined the entire effort. Because, and it gets back to this idea of conflict, right? When you have no conflict, when there are no debates internally within the party, much less externally out on the campaign trail or on the floor of the House or the Senate, as to what you believe, then it's easy to say, we all believe in this. We want to repeal Obamacare. Well, when you add repeal and replace together, guess what? It becomes very obvious very quickly that not only do you not all agree on repeal, you also don't agree on replace. And it begins to take longer and longer. And this gets back to the sense of control and go back to Johnson and Mansfield, right? When you encounter uncertainty, what do you normally do in your daily life? You try to control things, right? You want to reduce uncertainty. And for you, the way to, to do that is to not let things happen. And so you begin to tighten your grip more and more and more. And that's what happened on healthcare. And that's what the entire process was basically, how do we go into a room and come up with this great idea? And then when that's not possible, how do we get like the least bad option, right? But what they failed to see, or maybe they saw it, I wasn't there, maybe they did appreciate it, but they were trapped in that process at that point. What they failed to see is that that process itself magnifies and exacerbates those divisions within the party. And it makes it difficult to get members to ultimately go along with this suboptimal thing in the end. I, I want to stop you there because there's something interesting in what you just said that I think is pretty subtle. That this process that is meant to close off debate, to sort of hide divisions, actually exacerbates them. Whereas these open processes where people argue between the trade-offs and, and have more of these divisions in public, as you close them, why, why does the closed process exacerbate decisions, specifically what is happening there that makes the, the divisions harder to overcome? Right. Th these are senators that represent states. There are a lot of people in states. They got lots of different ideas, and the senators themselves have lots of different ideas. This idea that you have a red team and a blue team, and there's a red position on healthcare and a blue position on healthcare is absurd. It's ludicrous. It can only perpetuate itself when you don't ask people what they think and force them to vote, right? Nothing clarifies distinctions like a vote because you ultimately have to vote one way or the other. I guess you could vote present or not show up, but members don't like doing that. Um, and so when you have a closed process, you never get to that point because you're going member by member and you're asking them what they think. And 
in the end, most members want to get to yes in my experience, right? All of them do, Democrats, Republicans. They want to be constructive and helpful, right? But when they have this bill that you just all of a sudden put on the floor at the last minute or unveil, and all of a sudden the constituents don't like it, the groups on the left and the right don't like it, everybody's trashing it. It's got like a, a an approval rating that's lower than the Nazis, right? I mean, these <laughs> things are bad. And even if you are inclined to support it because you feel like you had to, because you were intimidated, because you actually genuinely want to be a team player, you're not going to be able to ultimately do it if you want to make your constituents happy. And the process hasn't served its function of bringing them along, right? And so that's where you get a lot of the angst and frustration. You see it on the left and the right right now in, in our politics, where they, they don't trust their representatives. And the reason why is because they don't see them fighting. They don't see them trying. There's no effort. You can't see effort behind closed doors. You can't see a member who says, I fought as hard as I could, and this is the best deal that we could get. Well, they have no idea if that's true because they couldn't see it with their own eyes. If you put it on the floor, if you put it in committee, if you have votes, if you lose votes, and if it's really intense, if you stand up and talk all night, right, those types of things, guess what? At the end of the day, the members are going to be more comfortable voting for it, and I suspect their constituents and even the more activist-minded ones will be more comfortable giving their members a pass to vote for something that's maybe only 70-30 or 60-40 okay. Well, one thing that I remember from the way Democrats did Obamacare is that there were a lot of fights, actually, um, within the Democratic Party. A very, for instance, long fight about the public option. And should a bill that doesn't have a public option, if you're not able to pass it in the end, is that even worth passing? And that was a real debate within the party. I mean, I was in, I was involved in covering that debate, so so I heard it from all sides for, for quite a while. And I, I do believe that one reason the bill ultimately passed is that that debate had played out and there had been a, a sort of victory for the side that said, look, this bill still does good if you don't have that. And, and there were a lot of the things like that. And one thing that just was really striking to me was that the Republican Party was much weaker in terms of its own healthcare understanding. Its members were just less educated on it. It was more divided on its own goals. And then there was no process in which trade-offs got aired and debated. And so nobody ever had an answer for anything. Right. Whenever somebody did something and you ask them why, it kind of just happened. And the, the answer almost always was 51 votes. This is something we think might get us to 51 votes. I mean, we, we we did this thing where we asked eight Senate Republicans to explain what this bill was doing. And a bunch of them were just like, it's trying to get to 51. And in a world where you need to make trade-offs, if you don't spend the time making the case for why a trade-off is worth making, ultimately people don't make it. I really felt that one thing that was interesting in that debate was that Republicans really underestimated the importance of having the actual intellectual and policy arguments. It's like they thought that was window dressing they didn't need. And then it turned out they did need it because without it, nothing was really holding people together. There, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a consensus that had been tested and that people could justify doing something hard or doing something dangerous because they really felt persuaded that they were doing the right thing. There was no effort at persuasion. You're absolutely right. The original Obamacare process to pass the ACA, right? There was a lot of talk at the beginning of this year from Republicans about how this was the same thing that the Democrats did. It wasn't. The Democrats would have fallen all over themselves to get Republican votes for that bill. I think some of them were confused why some of the members who were participating in negotiations over the summer, or why an Olympia Snow who voted for it in committee but not on the floor, why they, why they all of a sudden switched. But the process itself was the Republicans could have done anything they wanted, offered, I suspect, almost any amendment they wanted. Well, how did it work out? They basically came in every day. Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid would negotiate over two amendments for that day. Both would be set at 60-vote threshold, so you guarantee it not to pass, right? And they would, they would vote on them. And then they would go home, and then the next day they'd come in, they'd do the same thing again. There was no real effort, it seems to me, on the part of the Republicans to really disrupt it. And I think part of that was they underestimated the power of the process to drive people to yes. Now, in this case, it was a partisan yes and not a bipartisan yes, but take somebody like Blanche Lincoln. When Harry Reid brought that bill to the floor, he didn't have the votes for it, Right. But the debate itself created the opportunity for members to socialize themselves and their constituents to the fact that they were going to vote for it. Now, ultimately, for a lot of them, it didn't work out and their constituents were never brought along, but it still worked out for them. 
And the process, therefore, allowed themselves to be convinced that they should vote for it. And so Blanche Lincoln offers some amendments, and they all fail, or a prior offers amendments, they all fail. And then in the end, they say, like, I tried really hard. I offered these amendments. They failed, and it's imperfect. I don't like it, but it's better than the alternative. I'm going to vote for it, right? That's the process. The process drives people more times than not to yes, even when it's managed in that kind of top-down way. Well, if there are good arguments in it. Right. I mean, I actually think that's, that's the, a... Let me ask you one other thing about this before I want to move on to another topic. The the world you're talking about here, a world of open debate, endless amendments, people staying at all times, people standing and having talking filibusters or having to use time that way, it's a world that selects for preference intensity. It's a, a world where the most committed senators exercise power that is outsized to how many votes they really hold. And I could make an argument, and, and I think probably actually believe an argument, that preference intensity is not the right thing to select for, that, that, that breadth is actually more important, that it shouldn't just be the case that people feel strongly about the thing they're going to lose or the thing they're going to gain should outweigh a much larger mass of people who aren't as engaged, but because of that, actually, in some ways, have a more objective view of what is good policy for the country. Why do you feel more comfortable with preference intensity? The first reason is this is literally how the Senate operated throughout the vast majority of its history. This is the process that allowed things like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to pass. Well, because, it's also how it allowed a right. lot of civil rights and anti-lynching laws not to pass. For right. A long no, time. and they're and they're good and bad in 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 all things. Right. You know, we had to read Shakespeare in high school. There, there's good and bad in everybody. There's good and bad in everything. But my point is, this is the way that the place worked, and this is the way that it did its great things, and it also, yes, it's not so great things. But preference intensity isn't a veto, and breadth also matters. And if I have ten members who believe very strongly in something, and they come up against 75 members that believe, eh, not so much, right? And then the rest are just who knows where. Because, you know, I love these old votes and you see the app, it's like 35 absences. They're like, where are these people? Um, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a hard time prevailing, even in that situation. Because again, it's not a veto. The way that the Senate is run today and the way it was run when Harry Reid was the majority leader basically gives the minority a veto if they so choose to use it. And that's my point. If the majority demonstrates that it's serious, or if the minority demonstrates that it's serious, it begins to equalize things a little bit more, and you do get to a more inclusive process and more stable outcomes. So I want to talk to you about another political science question here that, that relates a little bit to conflict, but is actually also related to the lack of it. I've been very surprised in the last couple of years about the porousness of the parties about how far they're capable of stretching to absorb new entrants. I could very much imagine a world of Donald Trump and Roy Moore being a world of new parties emergent. What I somehow have trouble with is the idea that Donald Trump and Roy Moore and Lamar Alexander and Susan Collins are all going to be in the same party at the same moment, all members in good standing. I've been... I don't know if I'm surprised that so many Senate Republicans are endorsing Roy Moore, but he's a pretty extreme candidate. The thing that has made me wonder is, do the parties have any boundaries whatsoever? Is there a candidate that if that candidate won a party primary, the parties on either side would, wouldn't endorse him? Has As a political scientist, has this period made you think any differently about what a party can and can't accept? I think the important thing to keep in mind and the political science literature on this does, I think, speak to this, is that there's lots of different ways of thinking about parties. And parties themselves can change. And so over the past couple of years, we've had this idea that you that parties are really strong, that they're cohesive, that they signify agreement around a common party platform, right? That's the, the most prevalent view, I think, of parties in the country today. And so from that perspective, what's happening is really odd, right? The fact that Republicans couldn't repeal the ACA, couldn't repeal Obamacare, that's odd from that because they all agree. Or that you would have this huge divergence in, in member positions across the board. And the same thing right now, what's happening in the Democratic Party is fascinating to me because it's, it's, it seems to me very similar to what the Republican Party is going through and the divisions that they're encountering. It's obviously different when you're not in control of everything. It's a much better time to tackle these things. But that view of parties doesn't explain this moment in our politics very well. But if you go back to this older view, right, 
actually, I shouldn't say older because this view is also pretty old, but this idea of parties as umbrella-like organizations that exist to uh, basically bring together lots of different interests and then articulate those interests to the best of their ability, a more pluralistic view in politics, then, then this makes a lot of sense, right? And that's what I think we're seeing in a lot of ways. And then there's another view that just says that parties, literally all they care about is winning elections. Right? They don't want to come, their members don't come to D.C. so that they can then impact policy. They come here and they pass bills so that they can go back and win elections. Right? And that you can certainly see kind of prevalent as well now, too. So it just comes down to how we think about parties. So that's probably a good segue to, to the final question I always ask here, which is, what are three books that have influenced you? It does not have to be on American politics, so it can be, that you would recommend to the audience? Well, I think it's... A book I read recently, but it just blew me away. And it's probably right now my all-time favorite book was Willa Cather's The Professor's House. It's a short book. It's She's a phenomenal writer. And this book just, it really just blew me away. And I highly recommend it. Um, Irving Babbitt, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, professor of French literature, of all things, at Harvard, uh, was a, um, wrote a book called Democracy and Leadership. A phenomenal book. And then the last thing, I, I, I read it every year. It's more of a multi-volume thing. It's not really a book, but go back and read in real time, and, and you can get them all, the debate, the notes from the debates of the federal convention. It's fascinating. And the, next year will be a good time to do it because it's going to be a like year, which means the days of the week next year in 2018 are going to be the same as the days of the week in uh, 1787. I'm a real dork. That is the nerdiest yeah. thing that has ever been so, said on this podcast. You know, Congratulations. When you wake up in the morning and you got your 10 pages of the convention notes to read and it's like June, Wednesday, June 10th, then it'll be Wednesday, June 10th. But read it. It's phenomenal. It's only like 10, 15, 20 pages a day. And you begin to get a new appreciation for our system and for its its beauty and for how extraordinarily lucky we are to live in this country, but also what went into it and, and the fighting and the conflict that went into it and the trade-offs that they had to make. And, and every year that I read this, something new comes out that I didn't know before. And, and then something that I thought I knew has changed. And I think that just speaks to the humility that we all ought to have when it comes to looking at our political system and trying to understand what's happening right now and, and what should happen moving forward. James Walner, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you to James for being here. I really enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Thank you to you for being here. I really enjoyed that. I hope you do too. Uh, the Ezra Klein Show is on the Fox Media Podcast Network. As always, I'm very grateful to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, who makes this whole thing happen. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>